Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very excited to um, attend my first uh, SIGTIC uh, event. So I'm CEO of uh, CIS Group, a uh, very proud sponsor of SIGTIC. So I'm coming from the traditional world of banking, but obviously very uh, inspired by what is going on in fintech. So to this morning, I was asked to um, try to answer to these questions. Are we seeing a major uh, turning point for financial markets and the economy, and how is it related to, um, to fintech. So this is what I will try to do in the next uh, 15 minutes. Indeed, we had uh, two uh, major crises um, in just uh, three years, so um, moving from COVID to high inflation with obviously uh, some countries uh, facing uh, even more difficult uh, context, to say the least. And to us, uh, this is creating, uh, let's say, a, a bedrock for some major turning points uh, on the macro and financial market side. So the first one is an obvious one. So moving from uh, deflation to inflation, uh, we have seen decades of, of deflation. Now it, it seems obvious that uh, we'll face some inflation for some years to come. It wasn't that obvious six months ago, remember, it was supposed to be transitory. And the least we can say that it doesn't look to be the, the case. So to us, these are some major consequences in terms of asset allocation, pricing and funding. I will come back on funding afterwards. Another key trend is what's going on in terms of globalization. Remember, the last five decades was about globalization offshoring, outsourcing, and probably we're going to see something which is called globalization. So some globalization, but at a slower pace. So the trade openness index have been going up during five decades, and it started to come down. It's on 17 with Mr. Trump, but obviously with COVID and what is going on in Russia, Ukraine, we're going to see uh, a more decline on that side. What does it mean? It means that if as a company, including financial company, if you are resorting less to outsourcing, that means that you need to have more labor force, you know, onshore, which means higher wages, and which probably means higher needs for, let's say, productive tools, um, i.e. technology and in financial company, that, more, that means more fintech. Another trend is moving from Wall Street to Main Street. Years of QE has mainly benefited um, um, shareholders rather than, than, than labor. And we start to see you know, some pressure for the gap to close. So there are more and more pressure on the wedge sides, which means that at some point, you know, this will eat into companies' profits. So again, here, technology and fintech in the financial world can be of help for companies if they want to maintain uh, their profit margin. Um, this one looks also obvious, but it wasn't that obvious a few months ago. It's moving from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. Uh, remember, uh, since 2009, we had a huge money injection by central banks. Who were the winners? Basically tech, fangs, and also Silicon Valley, so VC funding. And the key question now is, with the end of QE well, being over in the US and soon over in Europe, are we going to see the other way around? So will the winners of yesterday be the losers of tomorrow? And I will come back on that. Um, another key trend, which is coming from the end of QE and the, obviously the comeback of inflation, is the move from bond markets to risky assets. Indeed, if you look at it in terms of flows, so you have this, uh, this uh, green uh, line, which is flows into bond funds, QE has mainly benefited to fixed income products at the expense of risk assets. So equity flows, it looks a bit counterintuitive when you see the markets these days, but they've been going up over the last few months. Why is that? Because investors, they want some protection against inflation. So they are moving to risky assets. Something for WealthTech, for instance, to take into account. Remember the last few years, it was all about trying to find some income. And now it will be about finding some tools to protect your portfolio against higher inflation. The new fangs, um, the fangs, as mentioned before, they were the winners of the years of QE. Maybe now there are some new fangs coming. I remember two years ago, uh, I, I helped to set up uh, an, app, an app for a digital bank in Switzerland, and we're thinking about the first experience that customers needed to see when they were opening the app. It was just about 10 stocks, you know, the fangs, the Tesla of this world. It was all about these, these talks. Now things are moving because fangs are underperforming. 
Um, you know, there are also some question marks on the order mega cap. So maybe there are some new fangs, uh, and if we use the letters, maybe the new F is fuels, like energy. Uh, the first A is aerospace and defense. Uh, Another A will be agriculture, the N will be nuclear renewables, and then the G, gold, and metals and, and minerals. Also something to take into account when you prepare your menu for uh, investors. Um, another key trend is uh, from paper to real assets. Years of QE has been, have been all about liquid instruments. Maybe now, if you want to protect yourself against inflation, you need to go into real assets. So real estate, infrastructure, and so on. And if you look at some of the polls, uh, surveys into financial advisors, they see and they, and they say that they are seeing more and more interest into these real assets. So maybe the wealth stake of tomorrow will be much more about private assets. It's also a fantastic opportunity for tokenization, obviously. If you want to bring real assets to the masses, tokenization will probably have a very important role to play. Um, some geopolitics. Uh, it might be a bit counterintuitive to talk about, um, let's say, de-dollarization and cryptocurrencies these days, because you know, the dollar is going to the roof and cryptos are, are, are falling uh, uh, like a stones. But one of the key developments of uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis has been the freezing of central bank assets uh, held by Russia by the West. And this has, you know, came as a shock uh, for many emerging market central banks telling themselves, you know, why should I kept, you know, uh, my treasuries uh, if I cannot, let's say, uh, tap into it if I need so. And there were some talks, it was a few months ago, about why not, obviously, having uh, currencies like the one uh, being held into this uh, uh, balance sheet, but also why not some cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. So maybe the ongoing de dollarization will have also some consequences on the crypto space. Um, this looks uh, like an obvious one. This uh, came from... Um, Obviously, years of COVID, uh, accelerated digitalization. I think it's, uh, we all know that COVID uh, has uh, accelerated customer interactions uh, by several years with, with digital. And uh, obviously, this is something which uh, will stay uh, as a tailwind uh, for technology, including the, the fintech industry. And this one, you might uh, find it a bit surprising. Uh, I mentioned that coming from the traditional banks but it's the move from banks to non-banks. Uh, and this started before COVID, uh, and it just uh, uh, gets reinforced. Um, so basically, if you remember decades ago, it was all about the clients doing banking and financial transactions with Ease or Air Bank. And now the clients have moved to multi-platforms. They have their crypto wallets, um, they are doing crowdfunding through uh, dedicated platforms, uh, they have their, cr their credit card with Revolut, they are using robo-advisors, so they are really using all of the spectrum of platforms. Uh, and this trend is here to stay. As a traditional bank, we basically have two options. The first one is to be a fast follower, and the second one is to acquire some of this fintech. So for fintech, it will probably remain a very interesting exit strategy is to sell themselves uh, to traditional banks. So these are, let's say, among the, the 10 uh, uh, key trends uh, we are currently uh, seeing. Um, now, just want to address very quickly two questions which are more related uh, uh, to fintech. The first one, and I had some conversations with, with some of you before the, the event, um, is fintech funding drying up? Is, st if, is startup uh, funding drying up? Obviously, there is some correlation between what is currently going on on NASDAQ and the appetite to fund risky business. From my conversation, uh, it sounds that indeed uh, it was not the case a few months ago but it started to become a bit more difficult. And by the way, there were some uh, headlines uh, in the newspapers addressing this issue. Uh, you know, Evan Sequoia say, rest in peace, the good times. Uh, there were some articles about funding drying up and become more and more difficult quarter over quarter. But if you look at the number, I know that uh, unicorns is, is probably a bit extreme as an indicator, but if we look at the number of unicorns created by months, so that's uh, for 2022, it's in yellow, uh, you can see it remains very impressive. So uh, it, it looks like uh, large rounds and, and high valuations until now have still happened. So let's see after, especially you know what is going on uh, what has been going on over the last few days, if this remains. 
Um, looking at some numbers by CB Insights, the number of deals in the first quarter was the highest uh, uh, ever. Uh, funding was slightly down, but the number of deals was, was, was still strong, with obviously the, the US leading uh, uh, over Europe, but still very you know, impressive numbers on that side. So at least based on the first quarter, uh, there, is no signs, there, are, there were no signs of, let's say, funding drying up. And, and in terms of top equity deals, were also very impressive with Checkout.com uh, um, rising $1 billion with their Series D. Um, so, you know, to us, it's, I will not be surprised to see uh, some, uh, obviously, more difficult conditions, uh, but at least based on the last few months, it seems that at least for good deals, uh, there is still some, some appetite. Um, the other question, and that's the elephant in the room, is, uh, you know, is there a fintech bubble, and uh, is this uh, uh, fintech bubble likely to burst? Uh, I, I, I went through a very interesting article on DelhiFitTech.com, which addressed some points that you know, I, I share on, on, on some of these slides. Um, first, let's, say, let's come backwards. You know, if you look at the last two decades, we saw two crash. The first one was the dot-com crash. So that was a tech crash. And like any crash, it was due to over-leverage. Who was over-leveraged? Equity investors. The second crash, 2008, uh, was the fin crash, okay, financial crash. Uh, the reason here was uh, over leverage banks and customers. So crash often happens because of over leverage. So the question is, will we see the combination of the two? So fin crash, tech crash equal fintech crash. This time, over leverage is not coming from corporates. Corporates, if you look, you know, the listed companies or the unlisted companies, the balance sheet on an aggregate basis is, is, is much better than what we saw 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Consumers, they are not over leveraged. They had a chance to rebuild their savings uh, during uh, the, the COVID crisis, so they are not over leveraged. The leverage is coming from governments. Governments, we were talking you know, before about what is going on in Europe, for instance, they are over leveraged. So that means that if there is you know, this time, a crash or a session you know, caused by over leverage is over leverage is going to come by from the government, which means that this cycle might be very different than the others. It means that it will not be U shape or V shape, might last longer, but probably let's say the, the, the companies will, less, will get less hurt than it was the case in the previous crash. Is there a fintech bubble? Uh, I think one of the points I, I, I found very interesting in, in this article on, on daily fintech is the fact that there is no not a single fintech market. So there will not be a, fi a single fintech bubble which is going to burst. We know that, and you know this better than me, that some segments are probably, let's say, too hype. They were too, hot, too much hot money into it, and, and, and they are blowing up. But that doesn't mean that the whole fintech space will, will blow up. So I think that uh, segmentation here, selectivity will be uh, obviously very important. Uh, like in any crisis, there will be some winners and losers. So let's start with the losers. Uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, ventures which are burning cash at a very high speed, which are, you know, using advertising, uh, you know, as, as a way to grow, will struggle to raise you no know, money as they did in the past. So these ones are at risk. And obviously, on the investor side, the momentum investors, who, those who have been chasing, you know, high returns late, uh, might be in trouble. But there will be losers as well. Uh, probably, the, uh, sorry, there will be winners as well. Uh, the, the winners uh, is probably, uh, probably going to be the ones uh, which are already growing revenues at a decent pace um, and which still think and act as startups. So these ones are probably very well positioned uh, to grab market share. And obviously, ventures which are requiring less capital, uh, low cost capital, uh, will be able to thrive. And also, in terms of winners, like in all crises, what do you do in a crisis? You, okay, when you know that you can grow revenue less than before, you have only one choice, is to cut cost. So, you know, FinTech ventures um, who are able to help you to cut cost, will, will you be a consumer or a company, will probably, let's say, uh, win market share and, and do well in this context. So to conclude, look, it's, uh, we know it's, well, it's a difficult time for us as, uh, you know, in the traditional markets, uh, as a traditional bank, because everyone is going through this. Uh, it's not going to be as easy as before, probably, you know, for, for, for funding. 
uh, and for, for businesses, but we don't see this as the end of the world. Uh, this cycle is different, uh, and we believe that uh, there will be also great opportunities. And so wishing you uh, a great uh, conference and looking forward also to hear all of you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mancha. Wonderful insights. Thank you so much for sharing.